Welcome back to the Brittany Hughes Show. Happy Thursday, everybody. So first of all, just letting y'all know, if it sounds like I am terribly congested, it's because I am. Um, I don't know what it actually is. I am hoping beyond hope that it is just uh, seasonal allergies. I've gotten hit really bad with those the past couple of years. But then again, I also have a preschooler that just went to school, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And so it could be the end of summer, back to school crud. I don't really know. Hoping that it gets better, though. Um, at least I had the ability, though, to get up this morning and put on something presentable and try to be a functional human being, which is more than I can say for John Fetterman, who apparently is now going to just be able to do whatever the heck he wants. So uh, unless you've been living under a rock, I'm sure you've heard this story. The United States Senate, which is the upper chamber of Congress, by the way, comprised of 100 people who are supposed to be, I don't know, running the country and have half a brain, um, they will no longer be enforcing their own dress code rules in order to allow Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman to wear his hoodie and trademark basketball shorts on the Senate floor. <laughs> Lord only knows. Y'all, sometimes the stories that I have to tell, I, I just would have never thought. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer sent out a memo this week instructing the sergeant at arms not to enforce the chamber's longstanding unwritten dress rules, which apparently nobody can actually find a record of. They were just simply understood back from the days when such things were just generally understood. You didn't have to spell out the fact that if you're going to be a senator voting on the Senate floor, you probably shouldn't show up in your pajama pants. Nobody had to be told that. And yet here we are in 2023 America. The dress rules used to mandate coats and ties for men and business attire for women. They still do. We're just going to ignore them, though. Instead, now, quote, senators are able to choose what they wear on the Senate floor, Schumer said in a statement to Axios that confirmed the memo. All others, by the way, that are entering the chamber, including staffers, will be held to the old standard. So if you're a staffer, you still have to show up in your slacks and your jacket and your tie and your nice dress and heels if you're a woman or whatever. But if you're a senator, you can show up in your yoga pants and tank top for all anybody cares. Of course, leftists in the media want to pretend like this is about more than just letting Fetterman trounce around in his sweatpants. Okay, so they say that senators who are just coming back from the gym or who just got off of an airplane, they're going to be able to pop in and vote without having to go put on their suit and tie. Trying to make this sound like this just relaxes the dress code for people that are really in a time crunch and maybe they just went and, you know, rode 73 miles on the machine or whatever, or, you know, were, were, were running as fast as they could off of a plane and didn't have time to, to change out of their jeans, they're going to be able to come onto the Senate floor, cast their vote real quick, and carry on. That's not what this is about. And everybody knows it. Let's be real. This is not because Johnny Utah just ran six miles on the treadmill and doesn't have time to stop and grab his jacket before casting a vote. This is because John Fetterman supposedly cannot put on a suit without having apoplexy. First senator that we've had who cannot seem to abide by what is a very basic and understood dress code that is applied for eons. So Fetterman has already been hospitalized twice since he took office in January of 2022, and he has been raising more than a few eyebrows around the Senate for lumbering around these official Capitol buildings in his signature oversized sweatshirt, his gym shorts, and his sneakers. So this was a getup that he trademarked back when he was lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania, and he wore it all during his Senate campaign. Even though staffers back then assured reporters after Fetterman was elected that he would be wearing a suit on Capitol Hill post-inauguration just like everybody else. He's going to get a suit. He's going to dress like everybody else. You know, he, he's, he's not going to show up to the Capitol in a sweatshirt. We promise. Which, to be fair, Fetterman did for about four seconds. And then he was hospitalized for depression earlier this year. He spent like six weeks or something in Walter Reed Medical Center dealing with depression because, again, the man cannot hear correctly. He can barely form a sentence. He has problems processing questions. His staffers have had to ask reporters, look, we know that y'all yell out questions at everybody else on Capitol Hill, but you can't do that with Fetterman because he doesn't understand you. And we can't understand him when he speaks. This is a man who had a stroke, who is clearly dealing with cognitive impairment, 
Then he lands himself in the hospital for depression, and now he allegedly needs to look like a hobo to keep from being so depressed that he has to hole up in a hospital for weeks at a time. Dressing like an adult has proved to be too much for him. So to get around these Senate dress rules, Fetterman has been casting votes from the doorway of the Senate cloakroom before just vanishing off like Capitol Hill's resident Sasquatch. He'll stand there with one foot still in the cloakroom, so he's not technically breaking any rules, and he's got his sweatshirt and his gym shorts on, and he casts his vote, and then he slunks off. So under these new rules, or rather the lack of enforcing the old ones, he'll now be able to channel his inner Walmart soccer mom and show up on the Senate floor in whatever he wants, because after all, this is about his personal comfort, and we have to make sure that nothing upsets him. So... First of all, is I, I guess we shouldn't be terribly shocked about this. After all, lowering the standard of professionalism for a cognitively impaired senator that can't be bothered to put on a pair of slacks uh, seems pretty on par for a group of people that still includes, I don't know, Mitch McConnell and Dianne Feinstein. We seem to be dealing with some serious, uh, some serious issues in Congress uh, when it comes to people that cannot formulate sentences, can't seem to figure out where they are or what's going on, are, are dealing with extreme and debilitating bouts of, you know, mental and physical ailments. And yet rather than holding our leaders to a high standard, making sure that they are able to do the jobs for which they were elected, making sure that they're able to represent the country professionally, we're just going to lower the standards for everybody and make sure that these guys are comfortable. And I've seen some back and forth online this week uh, about, you know, between people that are absolutely incensed over this and the rule changing here and people that are like, well, you know, what's it really matter if he shows up in a sweatshirt? What's it really matter what he wears as long as he is representing the people of Pennsylvania, as long as he is casting votes, as long as he is doing his job? Let me explain to you why this matters. And the fact that I'm having to spell this out is so incredibly frustrating because, again, some things just used to be common sense. Some things just used to be a given. There's a reason why these rules were not written down and nobody can find a record of them because people used to just understand this stuff. But since apparently we have to explicitly explain this to the lemmings in the room in detail, let me give it a whirl. First of all, on the onset, it is infuriating to see senators who supposedly run this country and who we pay to the tune of $173,000 or $174,000 a year be held to a lower standard than most American workers. Most Americans cannot just show up at their company wherever they work and flout the dress code, say, I don't really want to wear what you're asking me to wear, and then the company be like, oh, okay. Well, we'll just relax things so that you feel more comfortable. We don't want things to be too stressful for you. We'll change the rules to accommodate you. Most Americans cannot do that. You wear what your company demands, no matter what that is. You show up with the understanding that this is the job that you signed up for. These are the requirements that have been placed on you. You knew that going in. And nobody is going to change that for your comfort level. If someone is too stressed out, too depressed, too non-functional or whatever to put on a suit and has to wear a hoodie to maintain their own mental balance, they should not be serving in Congress. I don't care who you are, Fetterman or anybody else. I'm not saying that you have to like the suit. I'm not saying that it's what you want to wear when you are lounging around your house on a Saturday. I'm not saying that it gives you magical powers that some like, somehow make you better at your job. Although, frankly, taking some pride in yourself does tend to boost your perception of yourself and others' perception of you. But at the very least, you should be able to dress for the job that you have without completely losing your marbles. If you are that fragile or that self-absorbed, you should not be in Congress. But here's the bigger issue with this, and here's what I think frustrates so many people. This lowers the standard of professionalism, not only in front of our own country, but in front of the world. It makes us appear as an unserious people who cannot even be bothered to look presentable, much less act like professionals. And we do not hold our leaders to that standard. The goal of professional dress is to communicate that you, when you take your own appearance seriously, you are also taking your job seriously. Now, obviously, there are jobs that necessitate a more casual dress. Blue-collar work, for example. There are certain jobs where you don't expect somebody to show up in a suit and tie. If I have a problem 
with the plumbing in my bathroom and I call a company and they send out a plumber, I don't expect him to show up in a three-piece Armani suit. That's understandable, right? We have certain jobs that necessitate a more casual dress because anything else would physically prohibit the ability for them to do their job. They need something that's going to hold up better. They need something that's going to get dirty. They need something that's not going to tear. That's understandable. That makes sense. But even blue-collar workers, when they go to things like weddings or a funeral or to church, they understand that cleaning up when you enter into a more serious environment is an expectation because it presents that you are taking whatever function you are attending seriously. If I walk into a bank to apply for a $300,000 mortgage and I am ushered into an office and I sit down and the guy sitting across from me that's supposed to help me with this is sitting there in a tattered t-shirt that looks like it's from 1993 and a pair of dirty jeans and flip-flops, that does not communicate to me that he is taking seriously what I am there to do and what he's there to help me with. It tells me that he didn't even care enough about his own self to get up that morning, take a minute to groom himself, to dress presentably, and then show up to work. And it's amazing to me that we can understand that when it comes to things like bankers or lawyers or people that work in offices. Again, not counting people that have to wear certain outfits for more physical labor. Even in those situations, a lot of times somebody will, will wear you know, a, a, a decent and clean shirt that has a company logo on it because a company wants to be re represented by their employees in a professional standard as much as possible. I understand that Fetterman here is supposedly trying to emulate the blue collar work from Pennsylvania. I get that. Because after all, pandering here is the name of the game. Joe Biden tries to do it all the time by claiming that he's a half Puerto Rican black activist truck driver whose house burnt to the ground that one time or whatever. This is, this is a, a, a political gimmick. But what's frustrating is that even enlisted service members, enlisted service members who make $25,000 a year are held to a higher standard of decorum and professional attire than the senators who make $174,000 a year who can send those guys off to war. That's what's fascinating to me. A professional attire communicates a message. And when we have leaders in Congress, when we have senators showing up in their PJs just about, what message is that communicating to the constituents that are trusting them to, to represent them? And on the world stage, where people are looking at this country and the leaders in it, what message is that communicating? It does matter. And the more we chip away and say, this doesn't matter, who really cares? Let's just lower the standard. Let's relax everything. The behavior that then follows that is the inability to take things seriously. Then again, this is Congress we're talking about. I don't know. Maybe people don't expect their congressmen and their senators to dress professionally because, quite frankly, most of them don't act professionally. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Of course, if you do care about high standards, you should probably be holding your health insurance company to one. Every single year, millions of Americans just like you pay exorbitant premiums for health care coverage that you might not need and don't even use only for your hard-earned dollars to go to pay for medical procedures for others that you might not agree with, things like abortions or gender-affirming surgeries. If you want to make sure that you are saving money and getting the coverage that you need without paying for procedures that violate your beliefs, you need Share Healthcare. With plans that start as low as $149 a month, Share Healthcare is not traditional health insurance. It's a cost-sharing program between people of like faith and values who simply want to save money and make sure that they're only funding the things that they need and that they believe in. Go to sharehealthcare.com, enter the referral code MRCTV23, that's sharehealthcare.com, MRCTV23, and find a plan that works for you and your family today. Speaking of decorum, we have here a tale of two women, if you will. This one has been fascinating to me. So on the one hand, again, unless you've been living under a rock this past week, you've probably heard this story. We have Lauren Boebert. Congresswoman from Colorado, um, who keeps finding herself in the public eye. She's, uh, she, it's interesting because when I first saw the story concerning Lauren Boebert, um, I mean, I'm not going to lie, it was interesting. I clicked on it, I read the story. But what was fascinating to me 
was that this story kept popping up in my timeline. The number of articles, the mere volume of media coverage that has been given to this story has been fascinating to me. You would think upon reading all of this that this was like the crime of the century. This was the biggest scandal that any congresswoman has ever been caught in. You would think this was a massive, massive deal. Here's the actual story. Of course, again, you've probably heard. Security booted Bobert from a Denver theater a couple weekends ago. During a performance of Beetlejuice, video from the event shows her showing up in a dress that frankly looked like she should have been serving cocktails at a Vegas strip club, not gonna lie, it's just what it looked like. According to the incident report, she and her partner were, quote, vaping, singing, and causing a disturbance, which led to multiple people complaining and to Bobert and her buddy getting kicked out. Now, what was not included in the report were clips from the scene that appears to show Bobert uh, being groped by her date. It's not incredibly clear. I'm kind of grateful that it's not incredibly clear. Frankly, I could do without certain details. Um, she has said she has since parted ways with this guy. Frankly, the whole thing reads like a couple of 17-year-olds uh, being morons in a theater, which is probably exactly how it would have been treated if Bobert were not, of course, an elected congresswoman and a Republican to boot. Which, in all fairness, being a congresswoman, being an elected official, does raise the standard of behavior, or at least it should, except that now senators can vote in their yoga pants, so really, who knows? It's amazing to me when we want to have standards of professionalism and when we don't. On the one hand, we expect these people to be above reproach and to behave like professionals and, uh, you know, to, to hold themselves to a higher standard. And on the other hand, it's like, well, this guy doesn't want to change into a suit. He wants to wear his sweatpants and his tennis shoes, so really... <laughs> Whatever, just let him do whatever he wants. Who actually cares, right? These are humans. We're all humans. Whatever. Amazing to me um, when, when these rules seem to kind of go out the window. Bobert has since apologized for her behavior, um, but she has been castigated online by leftists, of course, but also no shortage of conservatives because unlike the left, we do have the ability to uh, critique our, our own. By the way, side note, Regardless of what political side of the aisle you're on, this kind of stuff is what happens when you elect unserious people who are more concerned with their own celebrity status than serving as statesmen. I don't care which side of the aisle you're on, both sides have a pile of these. When you have a Congress that serves more to make people into Twitter stars than electing mature, intelligent people to represent Americans and actually do the work of the people. Uh, you know, Bobert is far from the only one. This has been going on for far too long. And social media and the ability of lawmakers to turn into insta-celebs with a couple of good zingers over on Instagram is only making it worse. Okay, so it's always important when, when it, it comes to electing our leaders to elect people that are serious, people that it's not just that they've got a good one-liner over on Twitter that you liked or that they said something that you agreed with. It's also important to make sure that these people are of good and sound character. I know, very difficult to come by these days. I get it. Um, but that's why this is so important. But back to Bobert, was her behavior trashy? Sure. You know, I, I mean, I get it. You're, you're getting what appears to be groped in a theater. You're causing a disturbance. You're, you're vaping. There was allegedly a, a, a pregnant woman in attendance who did not appreciate being vaped all over. You're causing a nuisance. You're, you know, hooting and hollering and singing and whatever. But it's amazing to me because, again, the way that this has been covered and the outcry over this makes it sound like this, this, this is the worst thing that an elected, con elected congressperson has been caught doing in recent memory. This is the worst of the worst. My gosh, it's just beyond the pale. Which is fascinating because if you contrast this with the story of one Susanna Gibson, things get even more interesting. So Susanna Gibson, she's a 40-year-old nurse and a mother of two. She's running for a seat in the Virginia House of Delegates in a Richmond area district on a platform that she is largely dedicated to pushing abortion rights. Um, and reports came out last week that she had filmed herself having sex with her husband and live streamed it on a porn website called Chatterbait under the username Hot Wife Experience. So I didn't know about this website. I could have gone my whole life without knowing about this website. But what this website essentially is, is it is a forum where you can pay to live stream someone engaging in various sex acts. 
What's more, you can actually make requests, if you pay enough, you can make requests asking them to do certain things. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a live performance, if you will. And Gibson was featured in multiple, it wasn't one video, this was a whole slew of videos of her performing. She asked viewers to pay the couple with tips for private showings, which included offering to let viewers watch her pee, be sodomized, get hit or choked. In one video, she claimed that she had had sex with three men in one day, but urged viewers, quote, don't tell my husband he was the third. Now, after these videos surfaced, Gibson did not deny them. Rather, she claimed that her privacy was invaded when the reports were made public, again, about the videos that she voluntarily streamed online for strangers for money. She claimed that this was an illegal invasion of my privacy designed to humiliate me and my family. She said it's, quote, the worst gutter politics. I would agree with you about the gutter part. So not only did Democrats come out in support of Gibson, it wasn't like they said, oh my gosh, that's the heck of a thing and we can't be having that and, you know, no, no, no. Came out in support of Gibson and her right uh, to, to basically hoe around on a pay-to-watch website. Some even used it as a fundraising platform, including uh, State Senator L. Louise Lucas, who posted a call for uh, donations over on Twitter slash X and actually used this as a, as, as, a, as a reason to fundraise for Gibson. So this was a, a doubling down. We, you know, she didn't do anything wrong. Here's Politico actually ran a piece entitled, So what if a candidate live streamed sex acts with her husband? Politicians have always pushed society's sexual boundaries. The next taboo is bound to fall soon. Here's what this piece actually wrote. On one level, and spare me the reflexive scolding, what's so appalling about what Gibson streamed? For one thing, as the Post notes, there's nothing illegal about Gibson's online adventure. It's not even extramarital. Granted, her performances prove that she and her husband are exhibitionists of the highest order, but we accommodate exhibitionists all the time without clucking our tongues. This article and the leftists who back it actually want us to believe that there is nothing at all unseemly. There is nothing at all wrong. There's nothing at all immoral or that, that detrimentally speaks to the character of a person for someone to live stream themselves having sex on a porn website for money and to get paid by viewers to take requests for increasingly bizarre and grotesque acts. There's nothing wrong with that. Really, we're the backward sticks in the mud for thinking that this is a problem at all. This is totally normal, especially, oh, look, guys, she, only, she did it with her husband, for heaven's sake, never mind about the fact that she claimed in one of these videos that she had actually had sex with multiple people and that her husband didn't know. Uh, we'll just pretend that having sex for money in front of strangers on the internet is totally fine and totally normal as long as it's with your husband because that's the narrative that the left needs to push in order to make this work. Now, it's interesting here. Herein lies the hairs that the left has to split. Gibson here had sex with her husband voluntarily on a porn site, and that's fine because it wasn't illegal, it wasn't out in the street in public. Insert detail here for why this isn't trashy and disgusting and vulgar and generally disqualifying from a character standpoint. Bobert, on the other hand, did what she did out in public. She caused a nuisance. Was it gross? No. Was it nearly as explicit? Hardly. But she did it without around unwitting people, and it makes it a crime of the highest order. This is, this is what we're supposed to believe. This is the double standard that we're supposed to buy. Except, see, here's the problem. The left has lost the right to make a stink about that because they promote vulgarity and sexual displays in public all the time. If they want to claim, well, what Gibson did wasn't that big of a deal because it was on a, it was on a porn site, you had to pay to get into it, she did it with her husband, it wasn't like she was doing it out on the street. They're fine with people doing this out on the street. Here's how we know. Because the left is perfectly fine with public schools giving your kids porn behind your back. They're perfectly fine with drag queens gyrating in front of kids. We've seen this on video. We have the receipts. They're fine with gay dudes in bondage gear strolling naked down the street and whipping each other as part of a pride parade through major cities. What Bobert did was nasty. True. Also true? I have seen worse displays of vulgarity on stage at music award shows, and leftists think all of that is perfectly fantastic. 
because they care nothing about morals or values or decency unless it can be used as a political weapon. Case in point, Cathedral of Hope in Dallas, a United Church of Christ branch, hosted a drag queen Sunday this past weekend to, quote, bless the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. This is the anti-Catholic hate group that's known for things like holding hunky Jesus strip teases up atop crucifixes. They push abortion and child grooming. Video from the event last Sunday shows a priest, or whatever the Cathedral of Hope thinks passes as one, leading congregants in a chant affirming the LGBTQ community as part of, quote, a, divi a divine diversity. Here's that video. <laughs> Themselves or who they love. We celebrate this divine diversity and commit to lifting up the voices of the LGBTQ community and creating spaces where everyone can thrive. In honor and strength, we pledge to be allies to the drag community, recognizing their full humanity and their incredible contributions to our world. We embrace Now, if that weren't all bad enough, this cathedral planned the event in protest, get this, in protest of Senate Bill 12, which is a new state law that bans explicitly sexual shows like drag shows from being performed in front of underage children, which, having been a Christian myself since the age of nine, I'm pretty sure Jesus would not have been okay with. So this is what they're protesting. Not only are they praising and venerating and blessing the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which is a vile and vulgar group of the highest order, which makes a mockery of people of faith, which makes a mockery of Christ, which is about as perverse as you can get. But this church, quote unquote, is doing this in protest of a state law that says you cannot perform sexual shows in front of children. Why? Because the left wants sexualization in front of children. It is all part of their child grooming platform that implants in a kid the foundation for the left's worldview of morals go out the window, values go out the window. You can do whatever you want sexually. Everything's about you and your feelings. That is the root of the left's platform, and they have to get children believing it from an early age. So they want children present at this stuff. They want children being exposed to kink at pride parades. They want this to be normalized from an early age so that they can raise a generation that doesn't question it. Whenever they say, well, what Boebert did was in public and what Gibson did was not, that is no longer an excuse that they can use because they are fine with perversion and deviacy and vulgarity in public all the time. And we have seen that. So you will excuse me if I do not take lectures on this stuff from people who think grown men dressed as strippers dancing for kids is okay or who think that having sex on camera for money is not reflective of one's moral character. And before you come at me with all, well, what aboutism is stupid, and two wrongs don't make a right, and we've got to hold our own to a higher standard, and blah, 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 hear what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying. Not what I'm not saying. Hear what I'm saying. I am not excusing Bobert. I am not saying that what she did was not garbage. I am simply saying that it is okay and reasonable to be infuriated and disgusted by having a finger constantly wagged in your face about decency and values from people who have none. When leftists demand that conservatives hold their leaders to the highest standards of professionalism and decorum, while at the same time openly and shamelessly stacking their own deck with degenerates. You can't even get your own people to wear suits, much less keep them from getting it on on a porn website. So please, stop clutching your pearls and step off.
And with that, that's the Brittany Hughes Show, you guys. Thank you for joining me on this Thursday. Hope to see you back here same time, same place next Thursday. Make sure that in the meantime, you head over to Apple Podcasts, hit the subscribe button on the Brittany Hughes Show. That way you won't ever miss an episode. Also subscribe to the Newsbusters podcast on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. That one is with Tim Graham. You do not want to miss it. Um, and with that, again, sharehealthcare.com. The referral code there, make sure you enter it is MRCTV23. We'll give you great information on how to get good health care coverage, keep more money in your pocket, and make sure that you're not funding garbage like this. Sharehealthcare.com, MRCTV23 is the referral code there. I'll see you guys back here next week. Have a great weekend. God bless.